The views and opinions expressed in Cold and Missing are exclusively those of the hosts. All parties mentioned are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Cold and Missing also contains adult themes and languages. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Ali McLaughlin Solkowski. And I'm your co-host, Eli Solkowski. And this is Cold and Missing, where we cover cold cases and missing person cases. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Ali. And I'm your co-host, Eli. And this is Cold and Missing. Alrighty, Al. Um, what do you have for us this week? So we are on episode 49, and we're on a missing person case this week. All right. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, let's do it. Great. So just as a content warning at the top, this case does involve a young person. Today, we are going to be talking about the missing persons case of Equila Hodrick, and this takes place in August of 1985 in the Bronx in New York City. But first, a little bit about Equila. Equila is eight years old in 1985. She was born August 19, 1976, and she would be 46 years old today. She was born and raised in the Bronx and was a true child of New York City. Equila lived on Briggs Avenue near 194th Street. This is close to Poe Park and Fordham University. Equila's block was actually featured on a 1983 CBS documentary called Our Block, and I'll link in the show notes where you can watch this to get a sense of what it was like to live on Biggs Avenue in the 80s. It's a really interesting piece that's a quick watch and shows a lot of the places that we'll talk about in today's episode. Equilla was tall for her age, standing at 4 foot 11 inches. She had a light complexion, black hair, and hazel eyes. She has a gap between her two front teeth and a small scar under her right eye. Her family describes her as smart and caring, a little girl with the world ahead of her. And now a timeline of events. Monday, August 12, 1985. It's a hot August day and people are outside on the street. It was still about 90 degrees at 6.30 p.m. when Equilla and her mother were sitting outside on the front steps. Equilla was one week away from her ninth birthday and she is dressed for the summer heat, wearing a red and white shirt, blue denim cutoffs, and tennis shoes. Equilla's mother, Tarona Hodrick, but she goes by Terry, is eight months pregnant at this time. Her and Equilla have a strong mother-daughter relationship, and Equilla would often help take care of her mother as her pregnancy advanced. As they sat on the stoop, some of Terry's friends stopped by to talk. You remember how it was when you were that age and your mom would stop to talk to her friends? It was not interesting. But something interesting did catch Equilla's attention. The Mr. Softy ice cream truck. Equilla interrupts her mother's conversation to ask for some money to buy an ice cream. Terry says no. She had already given Equilla some money earlier that day. Terry turns around to keep talking to her friends while an undeterred Equilla takes off down Briggs Avenue towards East 194th Street. The ice cream truck had parked around the corner on 194th. Terry could not chase after Equilla being eight months pregnant, so she watched her run down Briggs Avenue, but she was not worried. Equilla always came back and she was in her neighborhood. This was her block. Terry stayed on the porch, watching the corner, waiting for Equilla to return, but she never came running back up the street. As the night continued on, Terry's niece told her that she saw Equilla playing arcade games down at the game room at the end of the street. As it got even later, though, Terry knew something was wrong and that Equilla would have been back by now, so she called the police. Detective Frankie McDonald got the call that night and immediately the NYPD take it seriously. Detective McDonald, from the jump, believes that Equilla has been abducted due to her age and the circumstances. Detective Frankie McDonald later reflected on this case saying, quote, It was a heart-wrenching case. The mother was a genuine victim and this was a legitimate missing child. Many times in these cases, another family member was involved. Not in this one. End quote. It's unclear when exactly the following events take place. Equilla's case was not really covered in the media. We'll talk more about that later. But what we do know is that the NYPD set up a temporary headquarters inside the Hodricks' home for two weeks following her disappearance. They were able to track down the ice cream truck driver who was in the area the night Equilla disappeared. He did not remember seeing Equilla or her buying any ice cream from him. Police are never able to confirm the sighting of Equilla at the game room. 
Investigators also start searching apartment buildings in the surrounding blocks for Aquila. Police use scent dogs, and they even launch a helicopter searching for any sign of the little girl. But they come up empty again and again. Later that same week, on Friday, August 16, 1985, police are continuing their search for Aquila, and scent dogs picked up her scent and led investigators to train tracks near her home. Specifically, the dogs led investigators to a hole in the fence surrounding the train tracks. Police have learned from folks in the neighborhood that people experiencing houselessness often camped out in the tunnel near this area. Detective McDonald and his partner asked permission from Metro North to stop the train so they could search the tracks for any signs of Aquila. Police were told that this was impossible, so Detective McDonald asked who could make it possible. This ends up going up and up and up the chain to the vice president of Metro North, who did have sympathy for Aquila's case. He agreed to slow down the trains to 35 miles per hour so the police could safely search, and he agreed to let them search for 30 minutes. Once police were inside, they weren't going to be forced out, so they took three hours to search the tracks and talk with the folks who lived down there. They ended up talking with around 12 people along the tracks. One guy they talked to stood out to them. He appeared to be in a very emotional state and had a bunch of dolls in his possession. Police brought him in for further questioning, but after a few hours, it was clear he was innocent. However, the delay in the trains brought Equilla's disappearance to the news for the first time. Newspapers and local news covered the story because people were upset that they had been delayed during the Friday evening rush hour. At one point, a reporter for Channel 2 asked Detective McDonald whose decision it was to slow down the trains, to which he responded, quote, Nobody made that decision. We made the decision to search for a missing child. What is your story? That an eight-year-old is missing? Or that a few assholes from Westchester came home to a cold dinner? I don't have anything more to say to you. End quote. In the fall of 1985, so this is a few months now that Aquila has been missing, there was a block party happening on East 194th Street. This is the street Aquila turned onto from Briggs Avenue. City Councilman Fernando Ferrer thanked the block for their help in searching for Aquila and to keep looking. Detective Frankie McDonald also showed up to the party to thank the community and to give the neighborhood a phone number where they could call in tips. As Detective McDonald was leaving the area, a woman was digging through the trash and yelled out to him, quote, you're never going to find that little girl alive. She's buried up in Yonkers, end quote. Detective McDonald doesn't engage with this woman, but when he gets back to his car, it hits him. An ex-boyfriend of Terry's lived in Yonkers. Detective McDonald circles back to try to find the woman, but she's gone. He'll try to locate this woman for weeks, but he will never be able to find her again. Terry had dated this man for a short time. But he was into drugs, and Terry did not want that around herself or Aquila, so she broke it off. The day Aquila went missing, it's reported that the ex-boyfriend was in the Bronx. It's said that he was running around without a shirt on on Ho Avenue, which is about a 20-minute drive from Aquila's home on Briggs Avenue. Later that night, he was seen driving around the Bronx with his roommate from Yonkers in a red car. Detective McDonald will bring the ex-boyfriend in for questioning many times, as Detective McDonald believed he was involved, but the ex-boyfriend maintained that he was innocent and had nothing to do with it. In 1986, so this would be the next year after Aquila had gone missing, police still had no leads. Later that year, Aquila's case would appear on Missing. Have you seen this person? This was a show that was a precursor to Unsolved Mysteries. Some tips are called in as a result of the show, but they don't pan out. In 1987, so two years now Equilla has been missing, Detective Frankie McDonald decides to retire from the NYPD after 20 years on the force. He spent the last two years of his career working on Equilla's case. Before he officially turns his badge in, he goes through Equilla's case file, which at this point weighed 25 pounds from all the work he had done on the case. He went to go tell Terry himself that he was retiring, and she sighed and said, well, that's the end of that. Reflecting back on it, Frankie McDonald said, quote, She was right. After I left, there wasn't much more to be done. Although every effort was made by the police department to find her daughter, everything that could have been done was done. We tried. We really tried. End quote. Frankie McDonald also acknowledges that Equilla did not get the same media coverage as other missing children around this time, such as Aton Pates. 
Just to give a quick synopsis, Eitan went missing in 1979 and was a famous case out of New York City. Eitan was six at the time, and he had convinced his mother to let him walk to the bus stop by himself for the first time in Soho, Manhattan. The walk was two blocks, and somewhere in those two blocks he disappeared. Eitan's case had very intense media coverage, and a whole task force was created to try to locate the missing boy. By comparison, Equilla's case only had two detectives working on it and was not covered by the media until the train delays. Eitan's case was closed when Pedro Hernandez was found guilty of kidnapping and felony murder in regards to Eitan. Equilla's mother, Terry, did believe that the police did everything they could to find her daughter. She was very close with Detective Frankie McDonald and ended up naming her son after him. She says, quote, I thought the police did all they could to find my child. They worked hard especially Frankie McDonald. They searched every apartment building around here from Valentine Avenue to Webster. They really looked for Equilla, and for that, I am grateful. End quote. And then the case truly goes cold for the rest of the 80s and into the 90s. In 2001, Equilla's case is reopened by a cold case squad in the missing persons unit. Investigators go back and re-interview everyone from the original case file. Terry had recently moved out of the Bronx and into Manhattan, but she still kept her phone number listed in the phone book so Equilla could find her. Terry believes that Equilla was still alive at this time. She says, quote, I still be praying that she will come home. I know in my heart that she is alive because I can feel her. You know how it is with a mother and her child. You can feel them. She's out there. I know she's not underground, not my baby, end quote. However, Detective McDonald had a different opinion on the case. He says, quote, I hate to upset the mother, but I don't think she is alive. Equilla was very savvy for an eight-year-old. She knew her phone number. She was smart and street smart. She would have reached out to the mother. She wasn't a troubled child, and she had a good relationship with her mother. If she could have called, she would have, end quote. And that is the last update we have for Equilla. Her case is still open with the cold case missing person unit, and they have released an aged progress photo that will be on our website and on our Instagram. And the photo is Equilla at age 46. So they believe this is what she would look like today. So if you know anything about the disappearance of Equilla Hodrick in August of 1985, please call the NYPD Missing Person Unit at 212-694-7781. And the sources for the timeline today come from the Mount Vernon Argus, the Newark Advocate, Morning Centennial, Lansing State Journal, the Delaware Gazette, the Palm Beach Post, Daily News, Merced Sunstar, NY Press, Medium.com, the book My Father's Gun by Brian McDonald, and the CBS documentary Our Block. So that is the case of Equilla Hodrick. Uh, thank you for bringing it to the podcast. Um, I think my first like reaction slash question, the the like strongest one in my mind for you was like. Why do you think there was just like a complete like drop off of tension and energy? I think what played into this is something that we've talked about before, where Equilla was a young black girl from the Bronx, mm -hmm. and it did not generate any media coverage until the train delays happened. And even after that, whenever I was searching for her in old newspaper archives. I didn't come across a lot, but then I realized that they were misspelling her name. So the newspaper misspelled her first and last name. It's so disrespectful. Yeah. So after I found the way that the newspapers were spelling it for some time, you know, I was able to find a couple more articles, but there was just not as an intense media coverage as, for example, Eitan. They projected his picture into Times Square when he went missing, but none of that happened with Equilla. But Detective Frankie McDonald was on her case, and he was a very dedicated police officer and was very dedicated to this case. Yeah, like protect and serve, like taking an oath. Like I, I guess I see it as like something very, very serious. So like, yeah, I'm like, good for you, man. You did your job. That's like what they all should do, in my opinion. <laughs> Frankie McDonald is honestly, and, you know, I didn't read into everything in his career, but from everything I could find, he was a really outstanding cop. He had been shot at several times throughout his career, but he himself never once fired his weapon. So he was all about the de-escalation, 
all about doing yeah, the right like work. A, an incredibly like disciplined and balanced like officer. That, I mean, at least to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything that was kind of within the police's power or within his power, at least, like he couldn't create a task force, like he didn't have the authority to do that. But, you know, launching the helicopter, getting the scent dogs out, setting up a temporary headquarters inside of their home, like everything that was within his power for this case, he did. And Equilla's mother, Terry, is very appreciative of him specifically. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's no greater honor than like naming your kid after somebody. And her son is named after him. Could you go back and just cover again those critical moments where she disappeared? Um, My brain is grasping at them like when you wake up from a dream and you're trying to remember. Yeah. So it's around 6.30 in the evening. Okay. Equilla and her mother are sitting outside on their front steps, the stoop in New York City. And Terry's friends stop by or they're walking by. And Terry... Remind me of the date again. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No. So it's August 12th, 1985. Yeah. I was like, it's summertime. It's summertime. Okay, I had that right. In my yeah. Mind. Great. It's summertime. There's a lot of people <sighs> out. Hot. It is hot. It's around 90 degrees. And at this moment, Equilla hears the ice cream truck. Mm-hmm. So she interrupts her mother's conversation, asks for some money. Terry says no. She already gave her some money earlier that day. So Equilla runs off down the street. She's going to try to get some ice cream anyway. But Terry is eight months pregnant, so she can't chase after her. And Terry wasn't worried because she was like, Equilla always comes back. This is her city. This is her block. The kids play outside all the time. That documentary I mentioned, like, you'll see kids playing outside on the sidewalks in the street. And it, it is the section that Equilla lived on. So it really is a true slice of life for Briggs Avenue. So Terry sees Aquila run down the street. She sees her turn the corner on 194th. That's where the ice cream truck was parked. And that's the last time that Terry sees her child. Mm. And as the evening goes on, Terry's niece says she sees Aquila down at the game hall, the game room. There's a lot of different names for it that it goes by. It also goes by like the numbers hole, I think. So there's a lot of names for this It's a kid arcade, right? No, it's not it's not an arcade like we think of it, okay. like a Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. There were a couple kid games, but then there was also like some illegal gambling that happened there, maybe. It was just like <laughs> All right. you, you went down there to play numbers. Like I gotcha. there was lotto. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually a question that I have, because police were never able to confirm that sighting. But since it was Terry's niece, that's Aquila's cousin. I have to think that if she saw Aquila, she did see her. That because that's family. You're not going to mistake her for somebody else. You know, you know, you know your family. But there's also a part of me that thinks or that wonders, like, did the niece just say this to like placate Terry and just be like, oh, I saw her. She was playing an arcade game. She's fine. Don't worry. Yeah. But I tend to lean towards that. You know, as things progressed and it was clear that Aquila was missing, that the niece probably would have said, I didn't actually see her. So I think Aquila was seen playing an arcade game at some point that evening. Okay. I think that's where I'm at for now. Uh, I mostly just like am eager to, you know, do my own, like a, a little bit of just information digging. I'm glad we got to learn about who she was. Yeah, I just am like, the systems at play and the systemic racism and systemic so many things that that that's like all that it is like why not all as in it's something small but it's like this lack of like very basic human understanding of like different experiences and like you can see the like the cracks in the in the pavement of it all and it's sad it's just sad and i know i say it often on here but I think it's a space to echo it in because, like, it's really true that, like, there's absolutely no reason that, like, these cases shouldn't be solved. There's too much technological advancement in the world and, like, yeah. I do agree with you about the advances in technology, but I think a problem that happens with a lot of missing person cases, especially old ones, there's just no evidence to test. There was... Nothing collected at the time besides interviews. 
I know, and even if it was just like so mishandled, but I, I've always known of evidence, you know, Mm -hmm. there was a time where like the people had to make the conscious like switch of like, oh, wait, this could potentially be years easier, you know, Mm -hmm. like it, I'm sure like revolutionary for those folks at the time, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's easy for me to get frustrated. Yeah. But there is still hope. A case was closed in 2017 officially with, Mm -hmm. you know, a ruling. It would be great if somebody came forward and confessed to what happened and was just able to provide the family with some answers. That would be great. We would love to see Aquila alive and well and just coming home. That's always the hope and the dream. Yeah, it's interesting. And this is just like me looking at myself and how I observe true crime. This is definitely one of those cases where, like, I didn't really fill in the blanks after she turned the corner. Like, my brain was like, I I can't, you know, like, and because there was, like, really nothing, my my brain just wouldn't tell me the rest of the story Mm because it's still holding on to, especially knowing his case, I'm like, come forward. Like, come on. Mm -hmm. Someone, right? Someone, someone knows something. You, you think, you think so? That's, I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. For this case, you think so? Yeah. I mean, I don't think Aquila happened onto an accident by herself that would have like caused her an injury where she couldn't get home. You know, I don't, I don't think that happened in this case. I think someone purposefully stopped her from coming home again. I think she was abducted. Yeah. Well, um, Moving forward, at least with us on the podcast, I am looking forward to creating those graphics so, like, folks can see, you know, um, what she looks like, the age progression mm-hmm. photos, um, missing person poster. Yep. Um, all that will be on our, our Instagram. Mm-hmm. Again, if you know anything about the disappearance of Aquila Hodrick in August of 1985, please call the NYPD Missing Person Unit at 212 694 Seven seven eight one, And one way you can help not only this case, but all the other cases that we cover get out to the public consciousness is if you rate and review us in whatever podcast app you're listening to us. If you're an Apple, if you leave us a written review, it really helps the algorithm machine get us to the top and lets other people find this podcast, find this case, find these stories. So just by doing that, y'all are helping the mission of this podcast. Yeah. We'll have pictures of Equilla and the age progress photo up on Instagram with the beautiful graphics that Eli makes. <laughs> Thank you, hon. And they'll also be on our website, coldandmissing.com, where we have transcripts readily available if you are hard of hearing or if you know someone who is hard of hearing or deaf and want them to get in on this podcast community, you can go ahead and share our website with them. Thanks for joining us on Cold and Missing. I'm Allie. And I'm Eli. Have a great week and stay safe, y'all. Stay safe, y'all.